Okay, so now we are at Batri de Seville, which operated from June 6 to June 9, when the battery finally surrendered to the American forces. Interestingly, on the night of June 5th, June 6th, there were apparently 20 paratroopers from uh, the US Parachute Infantry Regiment 508 wrongly dropped, and it was the first attack on the bunkers here. But they were uh, very easily repelled. And more notably, this is the battery that was ordered on June 8 by Walter Olmsen from Battery de Crisbeck, who ordered this battery to fire upon his own positions to stop the American attack, which he did, leaving behind 90 US prisoners. For which he, for that action, he earned the Red Cross, the size and the Christ, so the Knights Cross. So we're gonna take you to a tour inside the bunkers. So I just paid eight euro for access, and I received an audio guide. So let's see how it all works. This fortification was built by the German occupying troops during the Second. The first materials and armaments arrived here in December 1941, when the building of the Atlantic Wall had just been decided by Adolf Hitler. Two and a half years of building and transformation made the Azeville Battery, erected by the DOT organization, one of the most complete fortifications in the military architecture of this Atlantic Wall. This DOT organization had the task of planning and building the means of communication the fortifications and the plants of the Third Reich. It employed as many as a million and a half workers in 1944, most of whom were doing their STO, or compulsory labor service. In summer 1944, at most of the sites, the German army had neither the means nor the time to build such complete fortifications as Asviel. The battery of Asviel was commanded by Commandant Treiber and his 170 men, who were necessary for the proper functioning of a station like this. This battery, which stands four kilometers back from the east coast of the Cotentin Peninsula and cannot be seen from the sea, needed a command post, and this was installed two kilometers from here to the northeast in a place which had a wide view over the coast. From that command post, for example, the shooting coordinates were transmitted by telephone to the Asviel battery. The battery of Asviel was identified by the Allies as a priority target, and on the 6th of June it put up an unexpectedly strong resistance to the American forces who had landed on Utah Beach. The landing area was bombed for three long days, and the battery only fell four days later, on the 9th of June, after intense fighting. further back from the cannons, so as not to concentrate all the shells in the same place. 
These deposits thus contain the main reserves of shells to feed the cannons installed on the outer gun platforms or in the casemates. When these casemates were small and only had access to a stock which was limited to the first rounds of shots, stores were replenished when they ran out. Here in Asville, the four blockhouses are large and each of them contains, among other things, two ammunition deposits, making eight in all near the cannons. These constitute the main reserves of the station. Germans during the occupation. This reconstruction was made in 2008 from the traces of the original paintwork which has remained on some of the more sheltered walls of the casemate and from some photographs taken just after the war. With these camouflage designs the Germans hoped to deceive Allied reconnaissance planes, transforming the casemate into a ruined Norman house with fake stone walls, a balcony, doors, windows and a bullseye. The corners of the casemate disappeared, thanks to the fake vegetation which blended the casemate into the surrounding environment. The defence system of the Atlantic Wall was decided by Hitler in compliance with the proposal by Rommel. This proposal went against the opinion of General von Rundstedt, who considered the immobile, hence locatable character of Rommel's solution to be disadvantageous. Von Rundstedt preferred a more flexible, mobile defence, with troops and armoured cars. The Germans thus tried their hardest to camouflage these fixed works and prevent any leakage of information on the features of these fortifications. The occupation troops thus declared the surrounding areas out of bounds. They scrupulously controlled circulation and disguised the military works to seem part of the Norman countryside. For their part, the Allies exploited the information supplied by the French resistance and reconnaissance aircraft, whose numerous flights prepared for the landing in Normandy. Another camouflage technique used to hide the casemates was to partly cover them with earth and grass. The roof and the parts visible to the reconnaissance aircraft had more traditional camouflage paint. Asveal blockhouses are all of type R650 a model created for 105mm Schneider, K331, K332 and 105 SKC cannons. 
Each was staffed by 25 soldiers, complete with anti-aircraft defense squadrons in the two outermost casements. In the corridor you have just come along, the two rooms on the right are deposits for close-at-hand ammunitions. Only these deposits in the four casemates were full at the moment of fighting. The two large deposits behind the station remained empty. The shooting chamber, with an area covering 120 degrees, thus houses one of the four 105mm cannons of the battery, which is installed on a central axis and has a rotation of 135 degrees. After each cannon shot, the artillerymen recovered the shell case and slid it into a chute through one of the two square holes on each side, today protected by gratings. The soldiers went down into this deposit through the large trap door at the back of the cannon to recover the used shell cases, so as to use them again. During the fighting, a steel plate blocked the chute to avoid falls. Another indispensable instrument during fighting was the smoke extractor above the cannon. An electrically powered turbine made it possible to evacuate the smoke from the inside of the casemate. The cannon shield almost wholly obstructed the opening, hence it would have been impossible to manoeuvre the weapon without extracting the air because of the lack of oxygen, even after just a few shots. Fire from the American battleship USS Nevada hit the casemate at two points, outside, at the place already observed during section 11, and in the room we are now standing in. The 356mm shell entered the cannon loophole without destroying it, perforated the right hand concrete wall, crossed the left part at the level of the loophole, bounced off the exit wall, and then finally buried itself in the ground. And all this without exploding. The speed of the shell and the energy it released generated an excess pressure of the air, a blast which killed all the men in the room, probably about 15, instantly. For the Germans, who had resisted up to then with very few losses, it was the first big shock at the heart of the station. Captain Capney, now the only man in charge of the surrounded battery, did not want to sacrifice all his men in the fight, which was already lost. Ammunition was beginning to run out, and from the post of command, two kilometers from here, Commander Triber had already authorized him to surrender before he himself evacuated the area. Some hours later, at the end of the morning of the 9th of June, the Americans heavily bombed the mined field which had blocked their attacks in the previous days. They fired 105mm shots from field cannons installed in large numbers west and south of the battery. Some people have estimated that as many as 1,500 shots were fired in that moment. Straight afterwards, the third attack was launched. The Germans put up a feeble resistance. The anti-aircraft cannon of the south blockhouse where the reception is now positions, covering Sergeant Riley, who attacked with a flamethrower at the entrance of the south casemate. When the information reached Captain Katnick, he left the blockhouse, accompanied by the American parachutist who had been taken prisoner on the night of the 5th of June, and walked towards the American forces, waving a piece of white cloth. The Asville battery had fallen. I just finished the tour here at Battery d'Azeville and it's wonderful, it's splendid. It's just amazing to see all these fortifications, the deep trenches, well guided with an audio guide, photographs of the men, information. It's a definitely must visit. So if you're here, it's just two kilometers away from Battery de Crisbeck, so you can make a tour out of it.